I'm delighted to be back at ODI and talking about this uh, very important issue. Um, as Andy was saying, I've had two different reincarnations at, at ODI. Um, now working as a consultant at SANA Consulting, and we do primarily work on aid for trade, region integration, um, aid effectiveness more, more broadly. Um, Tradecraft, and we have a colleague, two colleagues from Tradecraft at the back of the room here, commissioned us to do a study looking specifically at how EC, the EC and DFID um, do their m and &E of aid for trade. So in terms of the actual m and &E frameworks that they have in place, but also the, the actual evaluations that they do and looking at to what extent they look at poverty. This is my first time presenting with Prezi, so if I make any mistakes, be gentle on me. So just to give you a broad outline of the scope of the study, um, which I've alluded to already, we, looked, we were asked to look at how to differ in the EC measure or assess poverty impact of their aid for trade projects and programmes. And some of the questions looked at, do evaluations examine the effect on different sizes of enterprises, um, such as SMEs and informal sect the informal sector, where we'd anticipate that, that there are more um, poorer groups. Um, also looking at issues around evaluations, um, whether or not they differentiate between the impacts on different groups, men and women. Um, and also looking at, do the evaluations examine the impact on winners and losers? Um, because we might have an aid trade project that may have net benefits, but there may well be particular groups of individuals who actually lose in the process. So we were looking to what extent do DFID and the EC actually ask these questions when they do, when they develop their ME frameworks, when they do their evaluations. Now, I don't know how many of you here know what, what aid for trade is, but we don't want to go into too much of an in-depth discussion of what aid for trade is and what it means. But broadly, <coughs> we've got four four categories here. And as William would, would, would say from the OECD, aid for trade is essentially what any country wants to define as aid for trade, i.e. any aid that helps a country trade. Now, the OECD have come up with these four categories. Trade policy and regulations, so support, for instance, to trade policy formulation in a country. If we were to support Tanzania, for instance, um, through technical assistance on trade negotiations. Um, so very much at the sort of policy and regulation level. Also looking at economic infrastructure. So of course, you know, if you want to get your goods to market, you need to be able to get them to the ports and you need a fully functioning port in order to be competitive. Um, also building productive capacity, that's the broadest term, which might cover agribusiness support to, to enable um, countries to trade. It can include export promotion activities. And finally, trade-related adjustment, which is looking at potential losses that might be incurred as a result of, for instance, trade liberalisation. Now, how can aid help compensa compensate those losers from trade liberalisation? Because trade liberalisation itself does not is, is not a panacea. It will not necessarily deliver 100% <coughs> benefit. There may well be losers as industries um, restructure. So just briefly talking about the methodology, this was a relatively small study that we did for Tradecraft. Um, we did a literature review. We looked at the policies and strategies that DFID and the Commission have on aid for trade. Um, we conducted some interviews with DFID and the EC and some others, including um, the OECD. And we did a data analysis of the information that we could find from DFID and the EC in terms of their monitoring reports and their evaluations. And I'll discuss that in a bit more detail later. But just to highlight, one of the things is we found quite a lot of monitoring reports for DFID. We found very few for the Commission because these are not publicly available. And on evaluations, again, we found evaluations for DFID and the European Commission. But again, they, there were not many of those available, which we were surprised by. Now, in a sense, we had a, a loose hypothesis underlying our research, <coughs> essentially looking at the strategy that donors have. So if there's an aid for trade strategy in place, is that strategy informing 
the design of its projects and programs, including its M&E frameworks. Um, and when looking at projects and programs, do the M&E frameworks themselves consider poverty impact? So in terms of their performance, their results frameworks. Um, and then ultimately, the evaluations that were undertaken, did they actually explore the poverty impact of aid for trade interventions? And ultimately, in that whole cycle of M&E, what we'd want to, we'd, we'd hope and anticipate that the lessons that we learn from evaluations then feed back into project and program design. So we're looking to see if there are any mechanisms in place in order to do that. And I'm just going to highlight this slide very quickly. But essentially, you know, when we're looking at M&E, we're looking at a results chain from inputs to impact. So if DFID has a project where the anticipated impact is to reduce poverty, you can work back from that. You know, how do you reduce poverty? What are the outcomes you need to contribute to those impacts? Um, so essentially, it's a, it's a logic of your activity. You know, how, do you, how does it deliver, produce the results that you they're expected? So I'm only flagging that now because I may refer to some of these terms later, and others will. So I think I think a lot of us know that there is an increased focus on results, um, particularly over recent years. A lot of it down to you know the, the increased scrutiny that donors are under um, by their general population to demonstrate results from their aid, and to have this well articulated. Um, if we looked at, you know, are the expected changes associated with a specific activity, are they being defined and being measured properly? Are they using appropriate indicators? Um, and then actually looking at the observed changes of projects and programmes, the actual results, are these attributable to the specific activity? Because quite often what we will see is in, um, there may be results such as increased trade, or let's, before we even say increased trade, reduced time to trade, reduce costs of trade, and therefore increase trade, for instance. Quite often, the donors don't necessarily look at those results and then attribute those back to the specific activity. It might be a relatively small project, a small activity, um, and it can be quite difficult to see what is the impact of that one singular activity. There's a lot of assumptions being factored in about other things happening, external factors, etc. And just to give you a brief bit of background on where the donors are on, on Aid for Trade, or DFID and the Commission in particular, um, in 2009, DFID developed an overarching M&E framework for its Aid for Trade portfolio, um, developed an Aid for Trade strategy in 2007, so they, the framework was attached to that. Um, the EU has an annual Aid for Trade monitoring report, and the EC is finalising two evaluations as we speak. Um, which I think we're due in November, but, but now sometime in March, on trade-related assistance and private sector development, which covers quite a chunk of their work on aid for trade. Um, DFID has no, over has no plans, as far as I know, to do any overarching evaluation on aid for trade, but they do have, at present, a couple of initiatives. One is the Independent Commission on Aid Impact is doing an evaluation on aid for trade in southern Africa, I believe, um, and there's also going to be an evaluation coming up soon, looking at um, that DFID's commissioning directly, looking at the impact of some of its activities in in, in southern Africa, um, which is different to the IC, the independent independent commission on aid impacts evaluation. I just to explain how the DFID, how DFID and the EC do their monitoring. Um, both DFID and the EC monitor their projects and programs annually and on completion. However, one of the, one of the issues that, that we were raising is that insufficient time has actually elapsed to look at things like poverty impact because a standard project or program might be three years <coughs> long. Obviously, within a year, it's hard to determine the potential impact. Within three years, it's also hard to determine the potential impact on poverty. Um, and in our experience and from our investigations, 
we couldn't find any examples where a donor, not to say that, that, that they, they're not undertaken, but where a donor, particularly the DFID and the ET, had looked at the impact of their activities many years after a project had been completed. So I've summarised some of the findings which um, I've already alluded to. <coughs> First, and as I said before, quite surprising for us that there was um, you know, very little publicly available information on whether aid for trade projects and programmes are impacting on the poor. In fact, even the evidence on the impact on, on trade, in many cases, is limited. And poverty reduction, I think, in a, in a lot of donors, donor projects and programmes is seen as a sort of lofty, top and high-level goal, um, which in many cases is considered too difficult to assess that linkage between the activity and the poverty impact. So attribution is, is, is not assessed. According to the last OECD WTO Global Review, um, there's another one coming up which William will talk about later, attributing trade and poverty impacts to projects and programmes is one of the major challenges for donors. And something, again, that I alluded to early, earlier, that there's often a, a gap between the st strategic um, ambitions and statements on poverty reduction. So, for instance, DFID and its aid for trade strategy would say um, have various objectives related to poverty reduction. But when you actually look at the project and program design implementation and monitoring evaluation, this isn't necessarily being taken into account sufficiently. But I think, I mean, the second point is, is in a sense highlighting a, a sort of risk, a limitation, that you know, we have to be realistic here. In many cases, a lot of the projects and programmes, it's very difficult. It's, it's a long, complex and indirect path from looking at um, a programme that is supporting maybe policy or regulatory reform and actually then looking at the impact on the poor. Uh, and and, and the, the last bullet point as well is something I'd like to flag up, is I think that going back to that issue of increased scrutiny about how aid is being spent and, and what's being delivered, I think, you know, if we, in the UK, the general public wants to see that their money is being spent well and that it's having a poverty impact. Given the complexities of doing that, I think quite often there's um, an inclination or a move towards picking up on those sort of easy, quick wins. So if you, if you went on to a donor's website, they might have an example of a relatively small project that supported a community, or even you know, fewer people in a community, and where the, you know, the case story do interviews, et cetera, with individual people, and then tell that story of how they've had an impact on poverty. And in a sense, you know, those examples don't cover a large percentage of, of the aid for trade support that's been provided. Again, uh, I have alluded to this. In many cases, the causal linkages between project activities and impact on poverty is, is often based on a series of assumptions. And in some cases, dare I say, a leap in logic unless the poor are direct beneficiaries of the project, so you can trace that impact. Um, there was a study, again, done by the Independent Commission on Aid Impact, looking at um, evaluation practices of DFID. And they said that you know, many DFID programmes do not have an explicit theory of change. Now, this defines a sequence of, acti of activities, events, that is expected to lead to, to a desired outcome. Know, why are we doing what we're doing? What's it going to achieve? What's the ultimate impact? And without that, it does actually make it very difficult to do a robust evaluation if you don't have the, the, the theory and the logic behind why you're doing what you're doing in the first place. So that's, in a sense, to emphasise that d design, not just evaluation during or at the end of a project, but the design of the project is very important. I think it's important to flag up the issues here. As we've said, DFID has a stronger results focus now. Um, but there are some concerns that 
okay, given their results focus, that there may be a tension between the long-term processes of change, those things that you know, alluding to that, that are difficult to, to explain, difficult to unpack, etc., um, versus the needs of needs and desires of donors to demonstrate quick results. So maybe a tendency to, to in a sense, cherry pick projects and programs where the result is more obvious and more obviously communicated. Which I think is also my second point. And where the linkages between activities and the impact on the poor or poverty are direct, measurement will be naturally easier. However, the impact of aid trade on the poor or poverty in many cases is not direct. Um, I think there's, there's a general issue here around demonstrating results and having the numbers to substantiate what you're doing. And I think there is an issue around you know, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. I'm glad I got that the right, <laughs> right way around. <laughs> now, my last slide, it's very small. I do apologise. Um, <coughs> these were the recommendations that we had in the Tradecraft report, pretty much word for word. We're suggesting that there should be greater accountability by donors um, in conducting more regular evaluations that go beyond monitoring information, so beyond annual information, um, and actually look at the in-depth and complicated relationships underlying some of the projects and programmes that they support. Um, and which are independent. And uh, DFID, for instance, is make, making moves in this regard, for instance, with the Independent Commission on, on Aid Impact. Um, and as I said, the Commission are currently finalising an evaluation on trade-related assistance and private sector development. Um, but that's probably, I think their last one was in 2004, their last comprehensive evaluation. We should explore the possibility of conducting impact assessments, ex post and ex ante, to better understand the poverty impacts and trade outcomes, rather than say it's too complicated. Should we be looking at this and unpacking it and understanding it better? Um, donors should provide greater transparency of their monitoring information. So for instance, with our analysis, we could have taken it a lot further had we had a lot more information, but it was very difficult to access that information. Um, Commission is, is struggles more in that regard. Um, DFID have now made a commitment that all of their information goes up on their project database, but in many cases it, it's still not there. You know, being a practitioner myself, having to look up project the project database and trying to source documents, quite often that there'll be a project that I know has been ongoing for three years, but it still says no information. Um, Donors should develop more realistic assumptions, theories of change and intervention logics behind the projects and programmes. Um, and uh, this will require increased research and analysis linking tho those activities and interventions. And a better understanding of the impact of aid trade projects and programmes on the poor and poverty. Whether to inform direct targeting or ensure the effects are known, positive or negative, because <coughs> In better understanding potential poverty impact, you may want to directly target the poor, but there are other interventions that you're doing that it, they're not necessarily directly targeted at the poor, but we would want to know whether or not there are any potential negative um, effects of an intervention. Also, in recommendations for non-state actors, um, apologies, these are quite brief, they probably should be longer. Um, but I think non-state actors or NGOs have a role to lobby for greater transparency of information. And I know a lot of that has already been taken, taking place, but I think there's still some way to go on that. You know, if that information becomes more readily available, it's not just simply to hold the do donors to account, but we can use that information, we can better understand. It's not necessarily DFID's comparative advantage to go off and do analysis about all of its projects and programmes. Maybe there are others who we should be doing this, and if, if they can access that information, the better. Um, undertaking more in-depth research to strengthen the evidence base, 
of the impact of aid for trade on poverty reduction <coughs> and better inform adv advocacy efforts on aid for trade. So you know, the non-state actors should be better informed in those dialogues. Um, and developing a network of key allies, including influencers on aid for trade. I mean, this was specific to, to, to Tradecraft because, you know, obviously you are more powerful voices as a few NGOs as opposed to um, one. And I think that's me done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Liz.